So this is um, uh, the extract about um, from my book of the grey heron. The grey heron is one of the most adaptable and successful birds in the country. You're just as likely to see it in a city park as a remote Scottish loch. You'll often see them standing motionless by the water's edge, waiting for the perfect moment to stab at their prey with a large dagger-like bill, their long necks unfurling. It's the largest predatory wading bird in the country with the wingspan of a golden eagle. It's stealthy, delicate steps around the water's edge are just as distinctive as its slow, slightly ponderous flight. Herons build large, messy nests of sticks crammed between the branches of old trees. The male collects all the material for the nest and the female decides where it goes. Sounds familiar? At some point between February and May, a clutch of four or five eggs will be laid and once hatched, it takes the young heron seven or eight weeks to get their wings. A word of warning, don't get too close to have a look. When herons are spooked, they have a habit of vomiting as a defense. Half digested pieces of eel and a water vole skull on your head is not a good look, just so you know. We had a heron problem in our back garden. It would sneak down on a dawn raid and help itself to the fish in our pond. We tried every defense, but it foiled all of them. It poked its beak through the netting. It stepped over the twine that was, and it was attracted to the plastic heron that was supposed to repel it. So I had this brilliant idea that I would wait up and when it arrived at first light, I would scare it off with my son's water pistol. In the best tradition of a stakeout, I got some coffee and donuts, filled up the inundator or the ultimate marinator or the Aquageddon 500, whatever it was, and settled in to give our heron friend a soaking. Sadly, I nodded off and the big thieving git got all our fish. In the end, we bought a plastic crocodile, put that on the pond's edge, and it worked a treat. The heron has never returned. It's the best six quid I've ever spent. In our, in our house and in our garden, we have um, a kind of, uh, I suppose it's a really, a, it's like a rescue center for animals. We've, start, we've started to take in rescue animals a few years ago. Started off with a dog and then another dog and then more dogs until we had a lot of dogs, then we had cats, and then we had various other things. And then we started to take in birds. Um, and these were uh, birds who, who could not be homed, who had been in a collection or a bird sanctuary, and for whatever reason, the owners couldn't look after them any, anymore. And because we had the facilities to do it, we had a bit of space in the garden, and we turned a section of the inside of our flat into a little glassed off uh, aviary, I guess. And so once we did this, more people would come forward and more people would say, well, we've got these birds, this parrot, this cockatoo, could you look after it? And so we found space for them. And so we live currently with four parrots, um, Molly, a Moluccan cockatoo. Uh, we've got Jacob, who is a, who is a Triton cockatoo. Um, we have Luna, um, a, which uh, she's a, a citron uh, crested, and um, we have um, um, Poppy, a palm cockatoo. And they're all from various sources of rescue cases and sanctuaries that couldn't find a home for them anymore. They were homeless, effectively. So we, they live with us. And, you know, it's, it's quite... It can be quite challenging because they're quite loud and they do make a racket in the morning and in the evening. But that, of course, is mimics their wild behavior, which is flock calling, you know. So cockatoos tend to like to forage during the day. And at the end of the day, they all shout out to everyone. Quack, quack, quack. Where, where's everyone? Where's everyone? OK, we're over here. Everyone over here. We're all going to fly back to the roost. And of course, 
that's great when you're out in the jungles of Indonesia and, you know, but when you're in a small flat, oh, that can be quite loud. Um, and the other thing is that they can be quite destructive because they're incredibly intelligent. They've got very powerful beaks and they like to gnaw things. And that's what this sort of, that again, so to mimic their natural behavior, we give them lots of toys. We're constantly giving them, they love a cardboard box more than anything. That will keep them occupied all day long. They love that. So we get a cardboard box, tape it up, put it up in their little nesting box. Ah, oh, they're happy as Larry all day. And occasionally you just hear, you hear the box being ripped to shreds all day. And occasionally a head will poke out and look at you. And then they go back inside and start ripping the thing. And, um, they're brilliant characters. They're amazingly uh, sort of um, entertaining as companions. You know, they each have their own character. Molly's very gregarious. She likes pop music. Uh, Jacob, she likes reggae. <laughs> you know, Luna and Poppy like more sedate classical music, strings that they like more sort of like romantic music. Um, Poppy's quite sort of, she's quite quiet and unassuming but she's got hilarious, she has hilarious moods when she just stamps her claw for some reason when she gets annoyed. Luna's very sweet, she likes certain people. They're incredible characters. They've got these amazing personalities, so, which I would have never imagined if you'd told me that, you know, well, years ago when we were first looked after a, a, a parrot, you know, I, I probably had very limited expectation. I thought they might just be sort of cowed or they're not, you know, they're just, they're wild caught or they're not, you know, they've been raised from an egg and they're, they'll, they'll just, they've had this sort of strange life and they might not have a personality. They're amazing, amazing creatures, but you have to be quite committed to, to have them in your life.